Hi everyone, my name is Ingrid Josephine and I'm the events producer at Startspace, powered by State Library of Victoria. Welcome to Business Book Chats with our special guest, Bernadette Schwert, who I'll introduce shortly. On behalf of State Library of Victoria, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional lands of the Victorian Aboriginal clans and their cultural practices and knowledge systems. We recognise that the State Collection holds traditional cultural knowledge belonging to Indigenous communities in Victoria and around the country. We support communities to protect the integrity of this information gathered from their ancestors in the colonial period. We pay our respects to elders, past and present, who have handed down these systems of practice to each new generation for millennia. Now, to firstly introduce Startspace, we are a support service for early stage founders and business ideas, for free and for everyone. We have a range of programs to develop your business, including talks, workshops, mentoring and networking events, as well as hot desks within Startspace at the State Library of Victoria, for those who are looking to work and connect in person. We also have a virtual community that you can connect with via our Slack channel. Whatever your background, age, industry or experience, and even if you're just starting out with an idea, we want to hear from you because we know that great ideas can come from anywhere. Find out more and join us at startspacehq.com. So next on today's guest, Bernadette Schwert. Bernadette is a former senior account director and copywriter for global advertising agency, Young and Rubicam Advertising, and worked on campaigns for clients such as Apple, Amex, Optus and Col Colgate, so super impressive. In 2001, she founded the Australian School of Copywriting and has since trained over 9,000 people to become freelance copywriters. She's the author of three best-selling books and is the host of the popular podcast, So You Want to Be a Copywriter. Bernadette was also recently named in the top 50 small business leaders in Australia. Bernadette, thank you so much for joining us to share your knowledge in this chat and in this book, How to Build an Online Business. Australia's top digital disruptors reveal their secrets for launching and growing an online business. Big title, it's rather, big book. It's rather long title, isn't it? <laughs> it's a mouthful. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Ingrid. Thanks so much, Bernadette. So uh, tell me, what inspired you to write this book? Did you have a burning sort of reason or need to enlighten the readers about something that you've learnt in your own business journey or something that you discovered from interviewing so many successful entrepreneurs? Yes, well, Ingrid, it actually started with book one. I had a book called Secrets of Online Entrepreneurs and what happened to create that book was I had a, a desperate need to understand how to build an online business because I had the School of Copywriting, which was a face-to-face -face training organisation, and then I wanted to go online because I'd had a child and I wanted to work from home and, and be remote. So I kind of thinking, how did other people build their online marketing systems? And so I thought, who's doing it really well? So I literally rang them up. And I said, would you be interviewed? You know, can I interview you? And they were really generous. And they said, yeah. So I thought, well, I've got like four or five people lined up. Why don't I bring a camera crew? So I bought a camera crew. And then those interviews became a TV show for Fairfax called Secrets of Online Entrepreneurs on the Fairfax, The Age and Sudden Morning Herald websites. And so this book um, was really, the, that first book was the genesis of those interviews. And then that book went well. And by the way, just so people understand, it's shameless plug number one. Um, that book then went, you know, well, and people said, can you do another one? Because we want to see how those businesses have gone and also things have changed. So can you update us? And so the second book, the one that you've got there was more about how to build a software business. You know, how do you make it scalable? How do you make it global? Because what we were seeing were, you know, big companies with like 13 employees, but let's say Instagram had 13 employees and it was sold to Facebook for a billion. So it was like, and, you know, things like Valve or GitHub, um, we were seeing these amazing success stories with such small kind of starting points and yet they were valued at so you know such a high multiple it's like what enables them to do that and that's what I was very interested in so that's what that book is it's a blueprint for how to build an online business. Fantastic so Bernadette um, there's heaps of advice um, in this book so I'd love to hear from you some advice when a founder is just starting out what are the really important things they should learn how to do themselves or focus on, at least in the very beginning? And when is it a good idea to engage um, some professionals or some outside help? Mm. I believe that the early stages, you should be focused on getting customers. You should be talking to those customers, getting really close to what those problems are. 
Um, it's about understanding the market. So, you know, going on stage and speaking and having people come up to you afterwards and ask questions. It's about maybe having a podcast and getting that sort of feedback loop going in so that you're learning and iterating the whole time. Um, the things that, you know, you should be focusing on is content, you know, creating great content so that when people do find you online, you look really good and people are able to understand, you know, what you offer. Things that you should maybe focus on getting others to do is sort of low-level things, things like building a website, even though you've got to be super involved on that, but you don't have to build it yourself. And I actually see a lot of people make those mistakes where they go, I'm going to build it. And I go, well, do you have any web building experience? No, it's like you're going to stumble, you know, in the first three things like getting your password from GoDaddy and then people just give up, you know. So it doesn't take much for people to give up because they become tech. There's some tech barriers. Things like database administration, sending invoices, um, sending emails, getting MailChimp set up, all that tech stuff and what I call virtual assistant stuff can be outsourced very efficiently and, and cost affordably. So I think they would be the uh, the ideas that I think. Just focus on where's the value, you know, where's your skill set? And if it's about being with people and understanding what your product is and getting that kind of feedback, you should be really focusing on knowing your product and getting getting close to your customers. Absolutely. And that's something that only a founder can do, can really communicate their vision and then talk to those customers and really find out how to improve and how to succeed when they launch. Amazing. Mm. Um, so um, you've spoken about a few practical things that you could potentially outsource um, quite easily these days with virtual assistants um, or, you know, engaging freelancers to help you with um, and things to do yourself. Um, section two of the book is all about minimum viable product or commonly abbreviated to MVP, um, which is likely to be something new to people launching a business idea for the first time. So this MVP concept, it can be sometimes quite overwhelming or um, mistaken for something completely different, like the process of making a physical prototype or even making a fully operational website. Those things aren't necessarily an MVP. So can you give us a really simple explanation of what is an MVP and what is it for? And why is this so critical in the early days of a business? Sure. So an MVP is designed just to get your product to market really quickly so that you can get some feedback. You can see if it's working. You can see if people are going to pay for it. You can see if there's a competitor out there. You can see how your points of difference might show up. So what you don't want to do is you create this amazing website or amazing prototype or app or piece of tech and then you realise it's already being done or it's taken you so long to create that that some other competitors have come into the market and scooped up your, you know, your niche. I guess the best way to describe it is like the donut, right? So you've got your donuts like a cinnamon donut. It's almost the plainest thing it can be. And then you've got the other side of the spectrum, which is the, the chocolate, coconut, Nutella, custard-filled donut with sprinkles. And so, you know, you don't really want to launch with the Nutella version because it takes time to make that and it's probably expensive to make it and you don't quite know if people want the Nutella or the custard. Why not start with the cinnamon one? Get it out there, say, is there a need for it? You know, do people really want this? And so you sort of start with the smallest thing and it doesn't have to be complicated. It could be, for example, um, a flyer, you know, a one-page flyer. In fact, that's how Uber in, in Australia began. Uh, David Rorsheim, who started Uber in Australia, who I interviewed in the book, he it's quite an amazing story. And I don't think a lot of people know about it, but he and his um, the, the other kind of collaborator, they went down to the airport in Sydney and had a one-page flyer saying taxi drivers wanted, you know, want to make more money. And they put the flyer under the um windscreen wipers of the taxis and they got their kind of first cohort of trials you know of people who wanted to trial the app and that's how uber in australia began so you know you look at it now but it began with a one-page flyer it could be even just a small landing page of a website and there was a, a wonderful man called morgan coleman who i interviewed for the book and he started up a company called bets on call and it's like a marketplace for vets and you, it matches you with a vet if you've got a you know you want to get your dog seen to and um, he kind of created the, the, the website, but with a lot of manual stuff in the background. So what would happen is if, just say, you needed a vet for your dog, you'd, you'd go online, you'd post what you needed and when you needed it. He would get that request and then he'd ring up a few vets and go, can you 
can you go to this person's house? So he had a couple of vets there and a couple of, you know, owners trying it out. But he was kind of the person putting it together manually. And after a while, he understood what were the issues, you know, where were the, the barriers for this being used? And then, of course, he teched it up so that it was, um, you know, automated. So it, a lot of things can begin quite simply. And it, it could be a slide deck that you send to an investor. You don't have to build the product. You can just pitch it. And, um, and hope people get the, the gist of it through just using some very simple tools. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, and it really shows that, um, you know, what, what it looks like on, on the outside could be very basic and it doesn't really matter if you haven't um, spent a lot of money. Um, you can um, find out really good insights, find out the demand for the product or the service and then work from there um, just you yeah. know, build, it, build it as you go. And just talk to as many people as possible because what you think is what you need may not be what the market wants. And just through the conversations, and that's when I was saying if you can get on the speaking, you know, at events or conferences, go to the co-working spaces that you offer, you operate, get on accelerators, um, you know, write some blogs, just get your ideas out there so that people can connect with you and then you can start to discover because, you, you know, you, you kind of want a niche product to some degree and the, and the only way you can really understand what people need is by talking to them and, and having them give you some feedback. Yeah, that's great. And it's also really helpful to start building your personal brand as an entrepreneur, as a founder, to get out there and for people to, you know, know who you are, read things you write, listen, listen to you talk on panels or network at meetups, for example. Um, well, that's right. People so, will yeah. buy you, you know, that they're, they're buying you when they invest in you early on or they choose you for an accelerator or choose you for funding. They're actually choosing you as the founder because the product is still a little bit maybe ambiguous or it's still in sort of beta mode. They really want to know about you. And so the more you can build your brand and create that authority and that credibility and get some nice content out there, the more likely they are to trust you. Absolutely. And, and to have that passion that comes through about your vision for this new thing that you're launching. Uh, great. So in the book, you speak about on online entrepreneurs who made it big early in Australia. And some of those think it's much harder now to, to achieve that same level of success. But then at the same time, your advice is that it's never been easier, or cheaper or faster to work out how to be good and harness the tools and technology that can make you really good. So what is the secret for online entrepreneurs getting into the game now? Um, is it generational mindset or change that has made it easier? Is it because those early pioneers have gone before? Um, is there something beyond the the developments of e-commerce or the global nature of business? Like, what's the kind of what's the magic that online entrepreneurs can harness now to succeed? There's a couple of ideas in there, Ingrid. Firstly, if you look at the current crop of digital natives, you know, maybe the 15-year-olds to, I don't know, 25, they're completely familiar with technology. They're not afraid of it. They have to use it for school. So using these basic tools, which for other people are quite complicated, it's just natural for them. So it's easy for them to set up an eBay store. It's easy for them to post a product on Redbubble or Invato or to create some kind of, you know, I don't know, some flat icon family, you know, just said, I mean, I was just working with a young entrepreneur just recently and he's only young, but he, he's really into design and he's now creating a sort of a product around icons and it just does it for fun, right? So I think what the younger generation bring to it is this sense of exploration and adventure and curiosity. They're not afraid to try something new and they can see this opportunity to make money quickly um, and, with, and putting in the work too, you know, they're not afraid of hard work. It's just they're going, let's try it out. And I think... That's, and they can build a website really quickly and, and they use social media. So they're completely ahead of the game when it comes to that sort of tech side and, and the sense of adventure. On the other hand, you've got maybe the older generations, you know, mid 40s or 50s, and maybe they're sort of on the cusp of they were in analog and then they came to digital. So they kind of got the best of both worlds. But what they lack is the confidence in tech. Um, and so therefore, I, I what they do have going for them, though, however, is confidence. They've got experience of working in, in, in commerce, you know, in the world. They know how to work with people. They're, they're good communicators. So they have all these kind of people skills but without the tech. So my vision, the thing I talk about in the book is, is about collaboration and finding the skill sets that you don't have and partnering. So, for example, the three circles, if you like, if you've got a hacker, you've got a hustler and you've got the old hand. 
right? So, for example, the old hand is the expert. Maybe it's like a 55-year-old who's brilliant at financial planning, right, but doesn't really like tech, but they know the world of financial planning brilliantly. And then you've got this person who's the hacker, which is kind of the tech person, maybe the builder of the website, builder of the app, understands AI or machine learning and any kind of tech that's going to make this product interesting. And then you've got the hustler, and it's kind of the front person. It could be the CEO, or it could be the founder, that person who's out there on stage, who's spruiking, getting investors. So when you have those three skill sets combining, it's a really powerful um, union because you, you're covering all bases. So I think everyone has a role to play. It's just about working out what can you do, what are you good at, and trying to, fo trying to focus on that. Fantastic. And, and that really speaks to how lots of new um, businesses starting up are not only um, sole traders or sole founders now, there's, you know, often co-founder relationships or, you know, teams of founders who are all going to bring something different um, to the business and a different skill set, um, which makes growing and scaling that much easier when you're not the only one having to uh, wear all the hats. If you look at Afterpay, for example, um, yeah, Anthony Ison is, is older than Nick. Molnar and he was an accountant and Nick was more of the ice he had this jewelry business called ice and he was really good at online business he was a, a top seller on eBay so these two guys lived in the same neighborhood and they were putting out rubbish bins at the same time and kept coming across each other and he could see the window of Nick you know the light was on at midnight he said what do you do and it was through that conversation after pay was born so you know it's a really good meeting of minds and, and different generations bringing different things to the party and I think just on that note I mean after pay obviously is supposed to boy for you know online business but they haven't made a profit yet and they were I think they did a merger for 39 billion dollars recently so I think the other thing I just want to communicate is don't get too hung up on profit yet you know that's often um it's a it's kind of an old-fashioned value in some respects and look you never sniff at a profit right profit's always fantastic but focus on getting users focus on getting customers focus on getting feedback and eventually the money will follow and, and the investors don't necessarily need to see the, that kind of um profit in order to invest in you they just want to see traction they want to see interest they want to see customers and usage and the potential for growth great um so we've talked a, a lot about some really interesting um ideas and, and ideas that have just maybe happened uh very um organically through running into someone putting out the bins in the neighborhood um, but I'd love to ask um, about generating ideas and how someone can hone in on a really brilliant business idea, um, but also maybe taking advantage of a trend or a niche that is underutilised. So what, what do you think, Bernadette, are the hottest industries and business ideas and areas that are prime for growth or complete disruption right now? I think any industry, I know this sounds like a, a bit of a motherhood statement, but any industry has potential for disruption and growth. And I think it's about what the individual's interested in. You know, it, it's one of the questions I think is very powerful to ask to determine a need. And what you're always looking for is a problem that's yet to be solved. And the way you get to that is by saying something like, wouldn't it be great if, right? It's just such a powerful little phrase. And you, that dot, dot, dot at the end, um, if you can insert the answer to it, what you actually uncovering is a need that is yet to be filled so if you think about uber like just to use that example again it kind of began with wouldn't it be great if every car passing by here right now on this paris street could become a potential taxi that's kind of where that philosophy came from wouldn't it be great if we could donate to a specific person you know and make sure the money gets to them rather than just giving money to a charity so go fund me uh, you know, that was a sort of an innovation in helping people donate to, to, to those that they wanted to. It could be, you know, would it be great if we could get individuals to invest in our business for just, you know, a small amount? Indiegogo or, you know, possible. Um, would it be great if we could get people to, you know, turn any kind of house into a hotel, Airbnb? So what I suggest to people who are thinking about building an online business or any kind of business is think about their own personal needs first. Like what is it you have in your life that you wish was different in condition? And she was really struggling to find a cream that could reduce the redness because she was on TV. And every time she was on TV and was nervous, the red sort of flared. So she created this, this, this cream and she got a chemist involved and it, it was because of her passion for this product that she had a problem with that her business was then sold to Revlon for a billion dollars and she was under 30 years old. So these incredible stories of 
people finding their own problems within their own lives. And often it begins with what's not working? What would you wish was different? I'll give you a small example, right? I'm of a certain age and, you know, through COVID and you haven't get to the hairdressers, you know, you can sort of go a little bit grey. So there's kind of like a spray you can just put on that just kind of covers it up for various issues. But the, it gets on your hands, right? So it's just a small little problem. But I'm thinking to myself, wouldn't it be great if you could have that kind of spray that doesn't stain, right? And it stains clothes as well. So, you know, it, it's kind of a small problem. But the smaller you can get and the more niche you can get, that's where you can go, that's mine, I own that niche, you know, and then it gets easier to market it because you know where the audiences are. Yeah, amazing. Uh, I think, you know, a great piece of advice there about, you know, what's a problem that you're experiencing or maybe it's an ex experience or a problem in your family or someone that you love um, and they're struggling with something and you're like, hang on, maybe I could have a go at fixing that or finding the solution. Yeah, Fantastic. I mean, if you wanted to be sort of outside in, like looking in, I mean, there's certain trends like I remember speaking at an event probably seven years ago and I talked about vegan plant-based food and it was kind of Huge niche. Now. You know, it's like if you had seen that trend coming as a butcher, like there's a, a guy that I trained recently, he's a speaker, he was a butcher, right, and he had this butchery, very successful, he sells to Woolies and Coles, but he could see the writing on the wall and he could see plant-based was coming, so he pivoted to create a plant-based meat. And so when the, the tsunami hit of, you know, plant-based sort of craziness, he was ready to go. And that's bigger than his meat business now. So it's about having that vision, looking ahead where other people are stopping here, you look further. You know, animals, animal rights in general is anything to do with animals, you know, and their fur babies. Um, it might be to do with sustainability. It might be to do with provenance of where things come from ethics it might be to do with um safety you know things are getting more difficult now in terms of privacy uh cyber you know you can just look at the problems we're having you think well there's got to be a solution for those particular issues it's worth looking around your own world and then you know finding something really you know simply to try and test um to see if you've got got that answer um so we've all had to pivot to varying degrees over the last 18 months even before the pandemic, lots of businesses might have started as one thing and then become something else. Um, so how important is having an attitude of being open to change as a business owner? Um, when business is already something that is a huge risk and probably a big change to your life, um, and there's lots of potential for failure and, and scary stuff along the way. So can you share some insights from your own business or people you've interviewed? How can you sort of hack this wild ride of business to not only survive but thrive when faced with change? I think it's about starting small. And, like, for example, my copy school, I started with a short course and it was like a six-week part-time, two hours a week, and I put it through a short course program. So I didn't really want to invest a great deal in it until I knew there was a need for it. So I, I just just test things. You know, you think about short courses are wonderful. I mean, I'm in the education business, so short courses are great for me. But you can see what's working. You can see who turns up, who paid money, who came for free. It might be a blog. You think about that book, um, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a, a, a Toss. You know, that started out as a blog. And that's a great way of testing content to see which headlines and which pieces of information are, are resonating with your audiences. Um, it might be through a podcast, which, you know, not difficult or expensive to establish. And again, you bring people in and you hear them speak. It's a great way to connect with people as well. So people that you may not have in your circle, um, if you can help them get what they want, then you can understand, you know, some of the needs. So I think it's about starting small, not um putting yourself under too much pressure and I know there's kind of different different thoughts on this some people say all in 100 percent you've got to go you know for it and that has merit if you have a backup right if you have funds if you have a house that you own right but if you're putting your house on the line or you're giving up your job to do something it puts you under enormous stress to deliver results quickly, particularly if you've got investors. And so that makes you do things that you may not normally do. You know, you might take investors earlier than you should. You might go in a direction that you don't genuinely think is right because you need the money. 
So if you can have, and this again is a polarizing idea, but just from what I've seen, if you can have a bit of a backup, maybe a part-time job or some kind of income producing um, endeavor that enables you the freedom and the space and the time to develop your idea, then you don't have to make decisions that aren't in the best interest of the company. So if you look at Canva, you know, um, their funding has been kind of privately accessed and therefore they can do what they choose to some degree, you know, whereas if you've got investors and you only own, you know, a, a fraction of the company, you're kind of at the mercy of other people telling you what to do and that stress of people saying, where are the sales, you know, where's the growth? So I think you've, you've got to protect yourself so that your idea can flourish, but I also think you want to enjoy it. I guess that's one thing I would say is um, why are you doing this? That's a really good question to ask. What is it you're seeking? Is it fame? Is it ego? Is it money? You know, the, the listing, the sort of the exit. Um, they are kind of difficult questions to ask because, but they're necessary because when things go wrong, you think, why am I doing this? Why am I waking to three in the morning? Why am I taking this kind of pressure? So it's, it's kind of helpful to ask, what is it you're trying to achieve and what are you getting out of it? Yeah, great. So having that um, real purpose and intent and being, um, you know, clear about that, not losing sight of that when it when it gets tough, which it invariably will get tough um, in yeah. business. Absolutely. Um, and also, Ingrid, just to answer your original question about pivoting, you know, a lot of businesses start with one thing and then throughout the discussions and the customers and the feedback, they go, you know what, why do we do this? And sometimes it's completely different to what they started with. I mean, there's a man I interviewed who runs a cable company, right? And his first thought was, let's sell TVs. And then after a while of going, the TVs are really heavy. They're very expensive to ship. They break down. We've got to fix them. There's warranties. He thought, why don't we just sell the cables that connect the TV? So then he became a cable company, right? But he couldn't do the cables unless he'd done the TV. So you sometimes you have to go fully into your idea to discover that there's a, a, an element or a niche within that that might be a bit better for you. And then learn, learn from that and then you can change and um, all different um, learnings can roll into that new thing. Yeah, great. Um, Bernadette, what, uh, we're on our last question now. Um, so I'd want to ask you, what is one piece of practical advice, practical advice that you would like the audience to take away either for their career, their future online business success or even just personal advice? I think you have to get really good at pitching. You know, I think you can have the best idea in the world, but without the ability to convey it quickly and convincingly with credibility, your idea will not land and it will not connect. There's a lot of C's in that sentence, I just realised. But um, I think really having that ability to construct a story and, of course, I would say this because I'm in the world of copywriting, but I think if you can understand the principles of persuasion and being able to write content or create some form of story that enables people to understand what you do, because what I see, and I was in an accelerator last year, a lot of tech people get really dominated by the tech and about the functions and the features. They forget what's in it for the reader or the, you know, the consumer. So get really clear about what problem you solve and make it clear. You know, don't if, if like my your grandmother, or grandfather, 85-year-old can't understand what you do, you need to explain it more clearly. So I think that would be the advice I give. Work really hard on getting that clarified. And the more you speak, the more people you pitch to, it gets clearer and clearer. And then you can suddenly see, ah, oh, that didn't work. They didn't understand that. I could see it in their eyes. So you need to re, you know, re, replace that with another idea. So that's what I think would be the biggest advice I could get is get comfortable pitching and get comfortable with public speaking because one to many presentations is a very efficient way of building a business. Because if I just want to have a meeting with one person all the time, that's time consuming. But if I stand on a stage and I can talk to 100 or 1,000 people in an hour, that's really, really efficient marketing. And also you've got the authority yeah. and the credibility. So I think that's the that's the advice I would give. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. And I think that might be surprising that we're talking about a book building online businesses, but um, really Bernadette's advice is to get out there, get visible, get comfortable um, at pitching and talking about your idea because not only is that going to help you refine um, the idea you're having, connect with potential customers and users, but then also 
uh, really get in front of investors and people who might be able to help you along the way. Um, and it's about getting your message and your idea really clear so people understand your big vision. Um, so I'll recap on another uh, couple of um, great pieces of advice from Bernadette. Um, starting small is a really big one. Um, you know, get that MVP um, very simply um, and also start small in terms of don't necessarily quit your job straight away. Have, you know, have your um, job maybe part time, have have this running as a new business as a bit of a side hustle while you are exploring things and, and working out everything you need to do and working out how you're funding it um, so you don't just go broke and um, everything stops there um, and make sure that you um, can outsource things that you can't do as a founder. You know, the really, really easy things like administrative or finance things, get some help with that elsewhere so you can focus on that big vision and also getting out there and talking to people, which you can't hire someone to do for you, unfortunately. Um, and also to, um, you know, protect yourself as a business owner, you know, really look after yourself so your idea can flourish. Um, so thank you so much um, for the chat today. Uh, Bernadette's book, How to Build an Online Business, um, is available in the State Library of Victoria's collection. It's also in the browsing collection on site at Start Space, or you can buy your own, own copy from our friends at Readings Bookshop who are in the State Library or online. Uh, Bernadette, uh, where can people head to learn more about you and to connect? Sure. LinkedIn is obviously a fantastic place and also copyschool.com if they'd like to learn how to become a copywriter or just write copy more effectively for their own business. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Bernadette. We really appreciate you sharing with us today and creating this resource for those starting out, um, building their online businesses so they can get to grips with some essential knowledge and skills and read about some people who've done it before or really successfully. So thank you again, Bernadette. Um, I'd like to ask those out there in the virtual audience, let's give Bernadette a virtual round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, Ingrid. Thanks for having me. A pleasure. Thank you so much.